And this message today, I think, is particularly one that people need to hear because I want to talk to you today about, about the heart of Caleb. Uh, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 26. I mean, uh, yeah, Numbers 13, starting in verse 26. And when you get there, let's stand for the reading of the word. Moses has sent them in, and they've gone in to recounter, the, re, re, to, to do reconnaissance in the land, to bring back a report. And in verse 26, they come back, it says, Now they departed, and they came back to Moses and Aaron, and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They had, they had uh, grapes that were so big they had to put a pole between two men to carry the grapes back. And then they told them, told him, and they said, We went into the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up all at once and take possession, for we're well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone has spies, is a land and devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, and came from, who came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. May God add his blessing to reading the word. You may be seated. I run into this attitude of the spies in the church a lot. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he said, I marvel how quickly you're turning away from the calling of the grace of Christ to a different gospel. The problem with the spies was bad theology. The problem in the church in America today is bad theology. You see, the problem is, is, that, is that people are expecting everything to be bliss when they come into the kingdom. I want to remind you of some things that Jesus said about the time that you're living in. In Matthew 24, he said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Currently, there are only 11 nations in the whole world that are not involved in some sort of a conflict. He said there'll be earthquakes in various places, Oklahoma of all places. There have been more earthquakes in Oklahoma this past year than ever before in the history since they have been keeping a record of such things. Famines and pestilences. The World Health Organization says the Ebola outbreak is beyond containment. It's just a question of time before it comes to the shores of every major nation on the earth. Jesus said there would be famines and pestilences. He said, you'll be persecuted for my name's sake by all the nations. They did recently a report that said Christians are the most persecuted religious group on the face of the earth today. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Jesus said it's coming, it's promised. So we're living in a time where if you pay any attention to what's going on in the world, it can be very unsettling, except for the fact that Jesus said, you will see these times, but he says, those that overcome, those that persevere to the end, those are going to be saved. He said, lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. Bad theology is the reason the hearts of many in the church are growing cold. Theology doesn't mean anything but the study of God and who he is and what our relationship should be like with him. Even an atheist has a theology as poorly thought out as it is. Everybody has some sort of a theology, some sort of an opinion of who God is and what he intends to do in our lives and on the earth. The modern day Laodicean church has the same theology as the spies in Canaan. They see God as Santa Claus. They see the covenant as a Christmas package. They see Jesus as a really nice guy that was really sweet and loved everybody, not as a revolutionary who came to start a war. They are not prepared to fight in a war. And as minute the giants manifest, you know what they do because they're not prepared, because they have no confidence in the anointing, they run. They run. 
This is exactly what the problem was with the spies. You know, when Jesus taught in Luke chapter 18 about the woman, the woman with the issue of, of, uh, of, of justice, she went to the judge, the unjust judge, and she petitioned him over and over and over again. And he says, the judge finally relented and he gave her her request because of her persistence. And he said, how much more will God also give you your request if you'll just be persistent? How much more quickly will he act? And then he adds an interesting comment at the end of that. He says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? The answer is, it's really questionable. And the reason is, is because the church has not prepared its people to fight. The church has sold them on some sort of a soft, feel good, have a nice day, be positive. Every day's a holiday message. When God is looking to raise up warriors to attack strongholds, to take it to the enemy, that's what God came to do. And if we don't get the message corrected, people are going to continue to confuse the covenant with Easy Street in Numbers 13, 27, and 28. They told him and they said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. This is the fruit, but nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. People think to follow Christ is to quit having problems. Numbers 13, 32, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report. How many of you ever been around somebody who's always got a bad report? Come on, somebody. God, those people are fun to be around. Man, you can go to the grain elevator here in any small town in West Texas and you drink coffee in there, I promise you, you'll get where you'll take your coffee somewhere else because it is, oh, we ain't got enough rain. Oh, we got too much rain. Oh, my God, the weeds are terrible. Oh, I spent so much money on my spray bill. These are the same guys that didn't know whether they could make it if the drought didn't break six months ago and now they're complaining because they got too many weeds. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Rand? They're always filled with a bad report. Bill and his family and Roger, they've, they've had to stand and say, you know what? Yeah, but God. I love what he said. You know what? It's dry, but yeah, but God. Yeah, I planted this Milo when it's curled up, and it looks like it's deader than a doornail, but that's not what you said, God. They've had to take a stand on the word of God in spite of what they see, and they've had to speak that instead of a bad report. The issue with the spies, the issue in Jericho was the first test for the next generation. The first test when they crossed into the promised land. The first test was, can you keep your mouth shut? Because your ancestors went on and on murmuring and complaining and questioning God until it brought them under a curse. Joshua says, shut your mouth. It's going to scare the dew out of you when you see the giant, when you see those walls and you see how fortified they are and you see those chariots racing across the top and you see how this city looks impenetrable to the natural eye. Keep your mouth closed. God says, I've given it into your hands. And when the time comes, you shout a shout of praise and you'll see those, when they did, those walls came falling down. They passed the test. They quit murmuring and complaining and started believing God. Come on, somebody. There's somebody in here and you just need to quit murmuring and complaining and just start believing God. Believing the word that he gave you. My issue with these spies, really, to tell you the truth, is that they were leaders. Listen, a congregation will get scared and break and run for the brush real easy. They're supposed to have leaders who have confidence in what God's doing, who understand what God's doing, who have an anointing or speaking prophetically what God's doing, are not moved by the circumstance, and the people begin to get faith based on, it says in Hebrews chapter 13, and those that lead you in their faith follow. Follow, watch them diligently and see how they overcome by faith, and therefore you follow them because there's times when your faith is going to be weak, and you're going to have to follow in their faith. But these leaders betrayed God and they betrayed the people because they came and they spread a bad report. They stirred up a lot of controversy. And the next thing you know, there was only two of them, Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two that said, we can do this. I know of no other way. I know of no other way to produce a disciple that doesn't rely heavily on the trials of the wilderness. If you think you're going to follow Jesus and not face issues or circumstances or betrayal or pain or loss, you just don't understand what he's calling you to do. 
to make a real disciple, you've got to have trials. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials because it will bring about the perfecting of your faith and the perfecting of your patience. And when your patience has become totally perfected, you shall lack nothing. When you get where you can wait on God, come on, somebody. When you get where you can wait on God and you can believe the word, when there ain't no evidence, that, that Milo field down there, I'm like Bill. I would drive by there and I'd go, oh, my God. But old Kaufman, he just kept believing the word and believing God and believing the drought was over. And guess what? When you need a little rain to get a little rain, you know, them old, them old uh, heads that had shriveled up or those plants that were starting to shrivel up got a little rain. Next thing you know, they're starting to bring them. That's a miracle crop. You know what? That crop is right there on the corner you have to drive by every day. So you can look at it and say, but God, I'm not going to believe what I see. I'm going to believe the word of God because this crop is a miracle crop and my life is going to bring miracle fruitfulness, not because of my circumstance, but in spite of my circumstance circumstance, because I'm going to believe the word. In spite of what I see, I'm going to believe the word. The trial that I go through is training me how to operate in faith. Numbers 13, 33, the giants, there were giants there, the descendants of Anak from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. They didn't see themselves as overcomers. They saw themselves as slaves. Let me tell you, this is a word for somebody in here. You got to get over your past. You're not who you were. You're not who you you're not what you did. Hallelujah. You're who God says you are. And God says you're a prince and God says that you're a queen of a great kingdom and that you have great anointing and you have the Jebusite anointing to come against strongholds. You may have been a dope addict, but you're going to lead the dope dealer to the Lord. Can I get a witness out of somebody? You have the anointing to make a difference. And I don't care about your past. You know, there's a guy that wrote a book called I, Went, I Got Schooled, and he, he, he studied. He was a Hollywood film producer. I can't remember his name. It's hard to say. And he studied uh, these school systems that really work, these accelerated learning deals that are really bringing kids out of poverty and bringing them into college, and they're, they're going on and scoring perfect SATs and doing all this stuff, and they're coming from the slums and the ghettos of American cities. And he said, the number one problem you have is not to get them to work. The number one problem is not to find good teachers. They're out there. The number one problem is you've got to tell them every single day that you're not your past, that you can break out of this stronghold, that you can be somebody. You don't have to go home and look at the slum you're living in and say, this is as good as it's going to get for me. You've got to break that. Every day we have to come against that thought process. Every day we've got to get them to quit seeing themselves as slaves and start to see them as sons. He didn't say that. I'm telling. I'm using that. We got to we got to break that concept of 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 my past is not who I am. They couldn't see themselves as conquerors. They saw themselves as still slaves. And when the giants manifest, they got scared and they run. But Numbers 14:24, my servant Caleb, because he was had a different spirit in him, and he followed me fully. I'll bring him into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Let me tell you, Caleb unleashed a generational blessing in his family. And he was a descendant of slaves just like everybody else. But he knew that that wasn't God's plan for his life. The name Caleb is pronounced Kalav in Hebrew. It's a compound word. K means all and love means heart. Caleb was all heart with God. He was all in. No compromise. He believed everything God told him, and he would not be deterred from God's promise. He didn't let his past define him. He and Joshua had a real close personal relationship with God. If you study Saul's life, and the youth were studying the difference between Saul and David, and if you study Saul's life, you see that Saul had no personal relationship with God. His relationship was through Samuel. So he had no idea who he was in God. And whenever God called him to do difficult things, he couldn't do them because, because he didn't see himself. He saw Samuel as being the one anointed of God, Samuel the one being favored of God. Let me tell you something. The way you break that slave mentality is you develop a relationship with the living God yourself. I can stand up here and tell you that you're blessed. I can tell you that you're a son, not a slave. I can tell you that God's got a great plan for you. But until you start believing it, and the only way you're going to believe it is when you start to enter into God's presence. 
And you begin to, grace needs to grow up knowing who she is in Jesus. Hallelujah. It'll give her the security to do all the things that God's asked her to do. Caleb knew who he was in God. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Caleb discovered a secret in the Exodus. The secret was this. Listen, this is going to be worth the price of your whole admission. What God's after is glory. All he wants is glory. If God can't get no glory for your life, he ain't in. But if you'll give God glory and you'll give him everything and say, you know what, my life's a mess, but God fixed it. I got this good job because I got the favor of God. God healed my marriage because we gave it to him, not because we read books and we got, because we gave it to him. And we go, if God can get glory from whatever you're doing, there's no limit to where you can go in God. Can I get a witness out of somebody? It says in Acts chapter 12 that Herod, or Herod wanted glory. He wanted to compete with God for glory. And it says that God struck him because he wouldn't give God glory. And he died and worms inhabited his body. God is saying to you, to doctors, he's saying to ministers, he's saying to lawyers, he's saying to everybody in, in the world, he's saying, I won't compete with you for glory. I've seen ministers try to compete with God for glory, and I'm telling you that anointing don't last very long. Come on, somebody. If you're sick, you know what? Doctors are wonderful. I'm glad you got a good one. Pray about everything. Don't do it just because he said do it. Pray about everything. But if he wants the glory for your healing, come on, somebody. Jesus, I spent, Carol and I went to see Larry and Brenda Taylor and Avery. We spent the day with them coming back from the horse show in Oklahoma City. Well, it wasn't necessarily coming back. It's like five hours out of the way to go. They, they're nearly in Arkansas, hallelujah. I mean, they need a lot of prayer, praise God. And he's very sick, being diagnosed with cancer and all of this stuff. And he, but he had that prophetic word. He said, if I could just hold on to the tassels of the talit. If you heard me preach about the woman with the issue of blood, you know what I'm talking about. I said, I'm coming. I'm bringing it and I'm coming. I got down there, 10 o'clock in the morning, hotter than a firecracker. Hallelujah. My head's going to say something else, but I better not. He's taping this, so I better be careful. Sweat pouring off of us on his front back porch. I said, I'm not Jesus. I'm just his representative, but this is his to lead. And this word says, the word says that there is healing in the hem of this garment. That woman said, if I can just touch the kanaf, the Hebrew word is kanaf. She understood prophecy. She was a biblical scholar. She knew that, math, that Malachi chapter four, verse two said, the son will come and there's healing in his wings. And the word there for wings is kanaf. It means the hem of his talit, which was the prayer shawl. I came, I put it on. He grabbed a hold of it. I prayed for him. And as hot as it was, it got a lot hotter. Hallelujah. You could feel the power of God. You know why? Because he made a confession about the prophetic word and said, if I just do what God said to do, I will be healed. And you could feel the spirit of God beginning to flow into him. Come on, somebody. He decided he was going to take a hold of a prophetic word and he was going to use it like a round rock in a sling to slay the giant of cancer. He was going to take a stand on God's word and not be moved by what people said and not be moved by what the doctors said. Oh, how is he? Oh, he's bad. Oh, you know what? He said, I'm healed in Jesus' name. It was a touching moment when a man who's struggling for his life decided to take a stand on the word of God. It was a Caleb moment. He became all in with God, all heart for God at that moment. We're going to take an offering up for him at the end of the service because they've got real needs. They're in a real struggle. But I believe that the minute he decided to make an agreement with the word of God and not with what he sees, I believe that a miracle was unleashed in his body. Caleb discovered something about God, that all he wanted was glory. If you want to turn to Exodus chapter 14, I want to show you something. This is, this, this is going to change your life if you'll get this. It changed Caleb's life. And you know the Exodus, Moses was sent in to get the people and bring them out of Egypt and bring them to the promised land. God sent him out there. Caleb and Joshua. Joshua was Moses' assistant. Caleb was of the tribe of Judah, the leader of the tribe of Judah. 
He gathered them up. You know what they all went through to get turned loose, but Pharaoh turned them loose finally after the Passover when all the firstborn of Egypt died. Pharaoh said, get out of here. Get your people and get out of here. But God wasn't done yet. God wasn't done getting glory. And this is what God told Moses in Exodus 14, verse 1. And now the Lord spoke to Moses and he said, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pi Haroth, between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Siphon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, the wilderness is closed in on them, and then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I'll gain honor over Pharaoh. So let me read that again. I'll gain glory over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I'm the Lord, and that they did so. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of the Pharaoh and his servants were turned against the people and they said, why have we done this? Let's go and attack them. So, so God is saying to this and Caleb's eyes got about this big when Moses said, we're gonna go and we're gonna encamp at Migdal. Migdal is a peninsula that goes into the Red Sea. It's militarily impossible to defend. When you go to Migdal and you set up camp, you're telling the enemy, I'm just stupid or I'm lost, one of the two. God said, I'm gonna come into Pharaoh's heart and convince him that you're wandering around in the wilderness and he will attack you. And he'll attack you, you know why? Because I'm fixing to give me some glory. Now you just do what I say. Caleb is going looking at Moses going, man, are you sure? I'm sure. This is what God said to do. How many of you got your back against the sea this morning? How many of you did, did everything God said to do and it looks like the enemy is closing in somebody? Come on. How many of you have tried to be obedient to the word of God, have tried to do exactly what the Lord said to do, and the enemy is just getting closer? I'm here to tell you what Caleb learned. Caleb learned that God will use his people as a trap, and if it will draw the devil out, he will close the trap on him so that he can get some glory, and only he can get the glory. Come on, somebody. Not Moses. Moses couldn't take no glory for being a brilliant military commander because he did something stupid. He encamped his people out on an indefensible position. But that's the very thing that God, how many of you have done something stupid? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God will use the thing that you've done to draw the enemy out so he can close the trap on him, so he can get glory. He said, I'm not done with Pharaoh yet. Of all the, the 10 plagues that he did in Egypt, all of them, God said, I ain't got enough glory yet. Wait till I drown his army. That's the God that I serve. Jesus said, I didn't bring you peace. I brought you a sword. Then he goes on and he says, I am peace. How do you reconcile that? When you see Ebola break out and you see armies marching against armies and you see Israel under attack and you see your own government leadership forgetting what this nation is about and turning, and turning on their covenant with Israel, when you see all these unsettling things, you remember this, the Lord still reigns, hallelujah. And he still has a plan, come on. He still has a plan and he's trying to draw the enemy out so he can shut the trap on him. You be like Caleb and Joshua and Moses. You figure out that whatever circumstance you're in, God just wants to get glory out of it. When he gets glory out of it, he's going to do a miracle on your behalf. Caleb and David, the great king, they saw themselves as giant slayers. Turn to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua 14, verse 6. This is after they have conquered Jericho. They've come in. The people have kept their mouth shut. They've done exactly what God said. They've confessed the word and nothing else. They've had great victory. They're beginning to march on Canaan and, re and take over the land that God intended for them. In verse 6, it's, Judah, it's the tribe of Judah. It's their turn to select a, a land to settle. And the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kisanite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea, 40 years ago when Moses was still alive and the servant of the Lord. He sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren, 
who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot is trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. He has said to me these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word of Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old, and yet I'm as strong this day as I was back then. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going in and coming out. And now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim, these were the giants, were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. And he conquered it. 85 years old, and he'd been hanging on to that word in the wilderness for 40 years that Moses gave him and said, your crops are not going to fail. You're going to have fruitfulness in your life. You're going to be blessed, and you're going to possess the place that God has called you to possess. I got news for you, children. Whenever you go to possess your inheritance in God, it will be occupied by a giant. You're going to have to fight. Can I get a witness out of somebody? You're going to have to fight and you're going to have to make a difference and you're going to have to stand on the word of God and you're going to have to throw the giants off of your inheritance. Caleb said, give me that place where those stinking giants still live. They caused me to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because I'm 85 and I can take them out because it ain't about me. This is what Caleb understood. It ain't about him, me. It's about him. Greater is he that is in me than him who is in the world. It's about the spirit that's in me. God would use an 85-year-old man to run a whole parcel of giants off like a bunch of scared girls. You know why? Because God is all-powerful. And God's word is going to come to pass. And the only way it cannot come to pass is if you don't believe it. You know what? They quit believing the word of God at Kadesh Barnea, and the, the, that generation passed away. They could have possessed the land just like Caleb did. Caleb had a different spirit in him. He understood that God's after glory. He understood that it's not about the power that's in him, about the, about the, in his flesh, but it's the spiritual power, the spirit of God working through him, and that the battle is the Lord's. David and Caleb both had confidence in the anointing. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. David had the heart of Caleb as well. 1 Samuel chapter 17. David's about to go against Goliath, the great giant who was an ancestor of these people that Caleb ran out of Hebron and settled generations before. They're still around. Guess what, folks? The giants are still around. How many of you believe the giants are still around today? Come on. Can I get a witness out of somebody? The giants of divorce, the giants of bankruptcy, the giants of, 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 of cancer, the giants of drought. There's always going to be a giant. You're never going to be in a situation where there's not a giant that you don't have to deal with. But you've got to be like Caleb. You've got to have confidence in the anointing. I want you to have confidence in the anointing. David had confidence in the anointing. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, this was the... This was Goliath the Philistine. When he went to the giant, verse 43, it said, so the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come out with my sticks? What are you doing sending a 14-year-old kid out here to face me? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, you come with me with sword and with spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He didn't have confidence in him. He had confidence in the anointing. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord doesn't save with sword or spear for the battle, listen to me, the battle is the Lord's. It ain't your battle. The battle is the Lord's. 
Who will save you from bankruptcy, from drought? If the Lord gets glory for your farming, the Lord will save you because the battle is his. And he will give you into our hands. And so when the Philistine came near David, he hit him between the eyes with a stone out of a sling and buried that stone. And when he fell, when that nine-foot giant fell, he <laughs> bounced and dust came up. And a 14-year-old kid grabbed him and grabbed this sword that was bigger than he was and whacked his head off and held it up to the armies of Israel and said, I have confidence in the anointing of God that God will bring my enemies into my hand. And they routed the Philistines night and day and ran them completely out of the country. They were scared. This is what leaders ought to do. They were scared and huddled up in the brush. And when David laid that guy out and whacked his head off, they came out of there fired up. This is what I want to see the leaders of God's church do is get fired up and say, you don't have to accept it like it is. You can change it because you have the anointing of God. You should have the confidence in the anointing. You want to have confidence in the anointing of God. It's not about you. Is he getting glory from your life? If you're giving him glory, there's no level that he won't go to to do a miracle in your life. When your inner life is strong and you see the giants as opportunities of God to get glory instead of something to be afraid of, that's when you begin to make progress. Amen? But the weapons of the new covenant, man, we got to check them out. Because we don't fight in the flesh anymore. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 said, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Our warfare tactics have changed radically with the new covenant. We're not in the flesh. The enemy has authority in the flesh. You can't fight your battles in the flesh. You gotta fight your battles in the spirit. What does that mean, guy? That means fasting. That means prayer. That means speaking the word. It means binding and loosing. It means waiting. Isaiah 40, 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall be renewed in their strength. Thou shalt run and not grow weary, walk and not grow faint. They shall be lifted up on wings as eagles. Fight the battle in the spirit realm. Another is praise. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that when we get to the end. Our weapons are for ferreting out spiritual strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. Our weapons are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought and making it captive to the obedience of Christ. Our weapons are for doing away with the enemy, and the only way you can do away with an enemy is attack his stronghold, the stronghold of addiction, pornography, poverty, religion. The stronghold of religion. I ain't about religion. I'm about the spiritual life. Hallelujah. Come on. I'm about walking in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, just like Caleb did. It's not about what I've done. I can't go out and do something to earn favor with God. I just have to receive that favor and be obedient to what he called me to do. And you know what happened? I possess the promise if I do that. You got the Jebusite anointing. You need to remember that. The prophet spoke over you. You can take out strongholds that previous generations have not been able to because you have a special anointing to make a difference. A word in due season from the prophet, and I want to close with this. Second Chronicles 20, 20 says, believe the word and you'll be established. Believe the prophet and you'll prosper. Well, here's what the prophet said. Chuck Pierce, this is his word for this season that you're entering into. August the 13th, he said this. He put this out on the wire. He said, I heard the Lord say, confrontation of the enemy is at hand. You must be filled with praise to enter into the conflict ahead. Let me read that again. You must be filled with praise to enter into the conflict to hit. Do you remember when Peter got thrown in jail and they prayed and he got turned loose? But later, Paul got thrown in jail, him and Silas, and in the middle of the night, they started praising the Lord. And they began singing and all the other prisoners began to sing. You know what happened? God sent an earthquake and destroyed the jail. Come on, somebody. If you're gonna win this conflict, you gotta have a heart that's committed and filled with praise. War is stirring in your midst, the prophet said. 
War is rising. Unless I rise and inhabit your praises, God says, you will not be able to praise in the midst of the conflict ahead. I'm calling you to a place, and I'm going before you so that I am waiting to give you the victory. I'll establish myself in your midst. When your conflicts arise, praise me. And I will assure you the victory in these wars ahead. God is saying that in this season that you're entering into, that the one weapon that's going to be most effective is your praise. I don't sing very good. I don't care how good you sing. Praise him. However you got to do it, praise him. This is what it says in Psalms. It says the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. You need to draw, David figured this out in the sheepfold. The way you draw God is you praise him. When you begin to praise him, God begins to come into your situation. He comes into your midst. The prophet Chuck Pierce says, in this season, you need to lift up a sacrifice of praise. And when you do that, God is going to begin moving in your behalf. You're entering into a battle. You got to become skilled with the weapons. Our weapons are not flesh. Our weapons are spiritual, and they're for ferreting out strongholds. And what you need to do is attack the stronghold with praise. Come on, somebody. But what you don't do is you don't retreat. You, 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 you say what David said. God is well able. The battle is the Lord's. It's not mine. You got to have the heart of Caleb in this season. And Chuck Pierce was at Zion in Amarillo earlier this year, and he said the very same thing. He said, you're entering into a season where you're going to get generational breakthroughs. You're going to get breakthroughs that you've had generations contending for in your family line, and you're going to get those breakthroughs, but you know what? You're going to have to get tough. You're going to have to get mentally tough. You're going to have to quit the, you know, have a nice day, be positive. That's all good. But you're going to have to fight the fight of faith and you're going to have to use your weapons. You're going to have to speak to that, to that Milo. You're going to have to say things. You're going to have to stand on a prophetic word. You're going to have to be ready to slay the giant because he's coming. And when you see him, you better not run. You better find you a good round stone and start slinging that baby around. And you better say, that sucker is too big to miss. I'm fixing to show you something. I'm fixing to show you God's favor on those that are totally loyal to him. Because God is good. And you begin to praise him and see if you don't get the breakthrough. Because God wants glory. God is after one thing. He's just after glory. And if he can get glory from your circumstance, oh my goodness, there's no telling what he will do to get glory. He drowned an army so he could get some glory. Is this making sense to anybody? But you can't be going, if you got cancer, man, you can't, if you got cancer, we're going to pray for you here in a minute because you're going to get healed because God's going to get the glory. You can't be going to the doctor and giving the doctors all the credit for your healing and expect God to do a miracle in your life. I'm not against doctors. I love doctors, but you know what they are? They're just like this knife right here. They're just an instrument. That's all they are. I can carve out something special with this knife and do wonderful work, or I can do something really damaging with it. It's just an instrument. The instrument is what, what the instrument produces is determined by the hands that hold it. And God is the one who's the healer. God is the one that will get your business to that place in the vision that you have where you got all them kids working and all of that wonderful and you just fish all the time. You just fish, and the kids take care of everything and just mail checks to the mountains. And Oh, I, that's my vision. That's not yours. I'm sorry. If you've got a vision in your life, you know what, how it's going to come to pass? It's going to come to pass because you believe the prophetic word, and you won't be shaken off of it. Hallelujah. We're entering into a season, folks. We're entering into a season where you're going to have to praise him. Now, there are seven keys to the heart, a heart like Caleb, and I didn't print this out because I want you to write it down. I'm a tactile learner. i got to learn by writing, so maybe some of you are. So I want you to jot these down. I'll be brief with them, but I'm going to give you a short explanation for every one of them. There are seven keys in this season to you having the heart of Caleb that you're going to need to go in and possess the promise. Number one, you've got to remember the covenant is not about an absence of challenges. 
The covenant is not about the absence of challenges. It's about having victory over the challenges. And I want you to quit using the word problems. I have people call me all the time, and they say, Pastor, I've got a problem. No, you don't. You have an opportunity for God to get some glory. That's what you have. Come on, somebody. Now, if everything was perfect with you and, 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 and you had all your bills paid and there were no health challenges and everybody was healthy and the kids were smart and they were all, you know, becoming law, you know, they were never getting in trouble over nothing and, and everything, how can God possibly get any glory out of you? Come on, somebody. You got to have a mess. You got to have a crop in the field that's dying that God can touch and resurrect so he can get some glory. How many of you got some crops in the field that are dying? I got good news for you today. God's about to do a miracle if you'll figure out a way he can get some glory. It's not about not having challenges. It's about having victory over the challenges. The word for problem, no, we're not using problems anymore. We're using opportunity or we're using challenges. The opportunity is, is for God to get glory. The second thing that you need to understand is you've got to know who you are in Christ. Look, you can't live off my faith. Saul tried to live on Samuel's faith and it didn't get him anywhere. Bill's got three boys that are doing awesome. God is really opening doors for them. But they have to cultivate their own relationship with God. I've got my kids and I pray for my kids sometimes because they got a lot of things going on and they're, they're having a lot of success doing a lot of things and all that kind of thing. And I, want, I, I just want them, you know, they're in a horse show. My kids are in a horse show in Fort Worth right today. I think uh, uh, my grandson won second by two points. That's, he needs to be second more. That keeps him highly motivated, hallelujah. And I think he got beat by that girl I told you about too. So that's a, you know, that really keeps him motivated, amen? But my point is, is that I told him, I said, you be sure God's getting glory from what you're doing. Know who you are in Christ and he's doing what God has called him to do. What has God called you to do? Do you know, because you know, because you know what God has called you to do. He's called Brother Randall to farm. I can already tell you that. He's not called Brother Randall to preach, but Brother Randall has got a guy at work for him that needs to hear the word of God. Guess what? There's an opportunity for Randall to make a difference right there on that tractor. Amen? He ain't calling everybody to preach. What has he called you to do? What's your vision? Know who you are in Christ. That way when the giant pops up, you won't run. You'll start looking for a good rock. Number three, See your circumstance as an opportunity for God to get glory. I said that already. And then manage it accordingly. So, so I'm in a circumstance here that's bad, it's difficult, and I've got real adversity, but what I want to do is I want to make sure that God is always positioned to get the glory out of it. Go camp at McDonald. Put yourself in a vulnerable, if God calls you to put yourself in a vulnerable position, put it, trust God. Come on, somebody. Don't do that just because uh, you want to test God. Do it because God said to do it. But manage it to where God can get the glory. Number four, it's, remember this, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about your ability, your good looks. Thank God it's not about our good looks, hallelujah. I didn't mean to be looking at you, Jesse, when I said that, amen, but... It's, it's not about our charisma. It's not about our personality. It's not about our ability. It's about our faith in the Word. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. You need to remember that. Caleb knew that. Number five, cultivate your self-image as a giant slayer. Begin to see yourself tackling things that you've been afraid of in the past. I want to tell you this about fear. Really, this is really true. If you step into your fear, you'll find it evaporate. The thing you're most afraid of, just square up with it and step, face it just the way David faced the giant, the way Caleb faced the giants. You know what happened? happen? You'll find it'll just dissipate. It's gone. Figure out what your fears are. Step into them with faith. Amen? Cultivate your image as a giant slayer. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Have confidence in the anointing, church. Have confidence in the anointing, not in your ability, but in the anointing of God that's on you. Number six, stay out of the flesh and learn to use your spiritual weapons. Fight the battle the way God said to fight it, not in the flesh. Number seven, 
Understand that in this season, praise is your greatest weapon because it draws the presence of God. Now, I've given you the equipment. I've given you what you need now to be successful, to slay your giant. And everybody in here has got one. If you haven't got one, God will provide you for one He's because he provides your needs and you need a giant. You need something. Go back to Judges chapter 6. It says that Israel, after Joshua, knew no enemies, so God raised them up some because they were getting soft. You need a giant. You need something to build your faith. You need something that you can conquer in the name of Jesus to get you stronger and stronger and stronger. So if you don't have a giant, get ready of fixing to get one. Now, when you get that giant, what I want you to do is I want you to remember in this season, the prophet says your number one weapon is praise. Your number one weapon is praise. He inhabits the praises of his people. So what I want us to do, and the way I want us to end this service is I want us to leave here praising God. We all got something we're struggling with. You know what? Let's praise him in the midst of our struggle. And if we'll do that, the prophet said, he will go before us and wait on us. How would you like to start the race and find, get to the finish line and find God standing there waiting on you? And he's already taken care of it. He's already run the giants out of town. All you got to do is show God that you believe him and that you're going to follow him and you're going to trust him. And you're going to praise him in the process. Hallelujah. Bill's going to come, and he's going to lead us in some praise. Now, if you don't have any problems, you, you're dismissed. You can go on home. <laughs> That's what I thought. And we can all talk about how totally deceived you are. Hallelujah. Amen. But if you want victory over your problems, we're going to enter into a time of praise right now where we lift our heart to God. And I know some of you guys don't like to sing. The dogs howl when you sing. I don't care. Let the dogs howl, and there are plenty of them around here. They howl all the time anyway, praise God. I just want you to, I just want you to lift your heart to the Lord. I want you to be thankful. I want you to be thankful that God has given you the victory. The battle's not yours, it's the Lord's. And if you've got a health issue or if you have a financial issue or a relationship issue, guess what? As soon as you turn it loose and say, God, it's not mine, it's yours, guess what happens? Sea parts. The enemy gets drowned. He gets the glory. And you get the victory. <laughs>